If you have ever experienced fear, uncertainty, or doubt, then welcome to the human race. If you would like to overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt, uh, so you can achieve more for yourself and for your team, welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could have been live, well, or you could be live with us for future episodes uh, on your favorite social media channel. You can learn more about that and find out who we're interviewing when, so you can join us live by going to either our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to have all of the info so you can join us in the future. Today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more by going to longdistanceteambook.com. And when you go to longdistanceteambook.com, you can get an excerpt, learn where you can learn more, and all of those things. Hope you'll do that. And let me now bring in our guest today. I'll give you just a second to get him here. There he is, Brendan P. Keegan. Let me introduce him to you and we'll dive in. His name, He is Brendan P. Keegan. He's the chairman, CEO, and president of the board for Merchants Fleet. If you're watching, you see it on his shirt. The fastest growing fleet technology company in North America. He's also the author of three books, including his newest, The FUD Factor. Get this, Overcoming Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, to overcome the impossible. He has contributed more than 200 articles to Fast Company, Inc., Entrepreneur, Newsweek, Fox Business, Harvard Business Review, and more. During his time at Merchants Fleet, the company has been named twice as an Inc. 5000 fastest growing private company, a Deloitte best managed company, and a fast company top 10 innovative company. That makes him not only a leadership expert, everyone, but an expert leader, and he's our guest today. Brendan, thank you for being here. Glad to All have right, you. All right, Kevin, thanks for having me. I, I love the energy. I love your podcast. I'm looking forward to uh, being a contributor this to this time. Well, here we are. Episode number 390-something. So uh, I'm glad to have you. And let's see let's see what people are saying here. I think we've got some people that have said hello. We've got, we've got Dallas, Texas. And uh, some other people are saying hello to me. We'll oh, leave those you. out for now. But uh, uh, so, Brendan, let's just start here. Um, you've written a number of books. You've got. A, you've thought a lot about leadership. You're you're running a company. Um, I'm. I don't know. Most people like when they're eight years old. Uh, you know, want to be a fireman or policeman, astronaut. I don't know uh, what you. A professional sports star. I'm guessing probably it wasn't running Merchant's Fleet when you were eight. So like, what leads you to this? Like, tell us a little bit about the journey that gets you to this point. Yeah, well, I, I, you kind of hit when I was eight, 10, and maybe when I was 15 or 16, one of the things, I I, I wanted to play professional sports. You know, I was that uh, you Had know, a football, feeling. football, basketball, baseball player that, that uh, thought I had a chance. And then God only made me so big and so fast and so strong. And uh, it just didn't have the credentials of a pro athlete, but sure, that's that's uh, that that's what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I did get a chance to continue sports into college, which was which was great. I'm glad I I did that, but kind of knew that probably junior senior year of high school that that wasn't going to go on. But what I did know, um, even in high school, is that leadership was my path. You know, I, I knew even at that point that I wanted to be CEO of a company someday. Now I didn't think it would be a, a commercial fleet. I thought it would be technology. You know, in high school, uh, I enjoyed student government with president of my class and I like technology. So I probably at 16 to 20 would have said, Oh, I'll, I'll run a company someday in the technology space. So, but uh, I, you know, not much different than most kids that, you know, like to dance or play the piano or play a sport. You kind of hoped, your hobby, um, your passion was going to be what you want, wound up doing. But uh, I, uh, I I found that leadership was really my path in, in life. So you've written this book called The FUD Factor, F-U-D Factor. Yeah. I'll hold it up. So I think the first the first thing, for those of you who are watching, that won't matter if you're listening, obviously, that you're <laughs> holding it up. Um, but I guess the opening obvious question is, what is FUD? Yeah. Uh, and, and why does FUD inflict us as well, humans? 
so what, what's interesting is like, we're actually all born fearless. Like we don't have fears. We just come into the world and we don't have fears. We don't really know what fears are. And then as we start to grow up, um, you know, our environment gives us fears. And, you know, as a parent now, I think of unintentional fears I've instilled in my kids. So, you know, I, I remember when my daughter was young, she got a skateboard and she goes, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to jump on the skateboard. And what did I immediately say? Where's your helmet? What about your knee pads? Well, where's the like, bubble I'm going to place you in? Right? But in her mind, falling was an option. There was, there was no fear of falling. I'm going to ride my skateboard. What do you mean I'm going to fall? But so, you know, unintentionally, I being a protective parent, and I wouldn't say a helicopter parent or a lawnmower parent, it's, hey, put a helmet on. Um, you know, go go back to Kevin when when you were a kid, when I was a kid, you know, we weren't we weren't uh seat belted into the back seat like it was a contraption going to uh to the moon. And you go look at a baby seat now and it's it's strapped in and that 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 kid's not moving. So these are all good things, but you know, as life's gone on, we've started instilling fears and and next thing you know, it's um, you know, you're 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 trying out for a sport and you're like, I hope I make the team. Well, what, what, why are you doubting you're going to make the team? And, and you start to have that doubt, you know, I want to ask this girl to prom, but what if she says no? And, and okay, let's these, be clear. That one's always been around, but that's a different issue. Yeah. But, well, but that when you were young, go ask a five-year-old, Hey, would oh, you yeah. go talk to that girl? Would you go talk to that boy? Absolutely. You see kids absolutely uninhibited, absolutely uninhibited. And then as we get older, we start to build this fear this uncertainty in this doubt. Now for, for some of us, it's a protection. Like, well, if, if, if I get told no, then I'm, you know what? I'm not going to try out. I'm going to give up football. I'm going to give up lacrosse. I'm going to give up the piano because I have uncertainty and doubt and out of fear, I actually give it up. But yet I might've been okay being an average piano player, being an average basketball player. But a as we get older and older and then, when we do fail, there's different reactions to that. I don't want that to happen again. I'm going to put the skateboard away. And then, you know, right now I, I love watching like on Instagram, little reels where you see a skateboard fall and fall and fall and fall. And somewhere along the line, they overcame their fear of falling. And they just viewed it as if I want to get better, I have to fall. So uh, one of the things you said at the beginning of that, which I think is really interesting, and I think it's true. <coughs> And that is that oftentimes these things are instilled in us unintentionally with really an unintended outcome. Like it makes me think of uh, the fact that like most kids, especially in urban areas today, would, would recognize this phrase stranger danger. But it's my understanding that before they started putting uh, missing persons pictures of kids on milk cartons, that didn't exist. Like we started putting pictures on milk cartons for a good reason. Let's see if we can find these lost children and yet it created this whole unintended consequence of oh my gosh uh can't talk to anybody right and i'm not saying that's all bad don't misunderstand yeah, me yeah. and yet what what happens is and, and what made me think of that was it's the unintended outcome and that happens i think for us as leaders all the time we say or do things with no ill intent with no with no thought and yet sometimes uh we're instilling something we don't want to instill so uh, i want to ask this so okay FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We, we, I get that. I think everyone understands that. Why write about it as it relates to us as leaders? Like build the connection between that fact and the skateboarding and the prom and all that stuff and us as leaders today. Yeah. So I, I think as leaders, it's, 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 it's not necessarily that different as, as people. So I remember my, some of my first leadership training. Um, I, I had been an engineer, I had gone to account operations and I'm a manager and like the very first day of training, they're saying, Hey, as first time managers, you find it really difficult in conflict management. Today, we're going to talk about conflict management. And I'm like, I don't know. Why did they already embed in my head? I find it really difficult for conflict management. So sometimes it's even casual language yep. or, Hey, we know as a young manager, there's lots of things you don't understand. Oh, okay. So now you're going to, now in a weird way, you're helping me, but you're going to point out and embed in my head what I don't know. So it, 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 it's tough because you don't want to sit there and say, hey, as young manager, we know you know everything. So I'm not saying swing the pendulum there. 
but we at you know unintentionally you know put different thoughts in people's head you know you know i'll i'll, I'll get with somebody and they'll say Brendan, someday i want to be a ceo i don't know if i can i'm like okay why do you think you can why do you think you can't <clears throat> and when i have that conversation 80% of what they say, 90% of what they say are thoughts other people gave them. Yeah, that's They're why what you just did is super important because I was thinking the same thing uh, because we do all sorts of leadership training and we try to not make those statements nearly as much as, I'm not saying that we don't ever do it, but we like to start with questions, which is exactly what you just did in your example, which is start with a question rather than starting with statements, which are basically um, sending our biases onto other people. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think one thing that's been interesting over the last, um, say, four or five years, you know, a lot of us have gone through unconscious bias training. And that that's tended to be around more um, things to do with uh, gender equality, um, you know, uh, how we feel about different races and different things. That's what it's been about. But you could take that same unconscious bias and put it towards leadership. Anything. And, and it's just, you know, again, we're at the end of the day, we're products of our environment. Now, sometimes we realize that we didn't have the best environment or we want to break the cycle of our environment. Other times we don't know. Like, you know, if you had asked me as a kid, hey, Brennan, you know, um, did you, or how did you grow up? Uh, what socioeconomic class did you grow up? I probably would have said upper class, right? Why? Because for football season, I had cleats. For baseball season, I had uh, a glove. For basketball season, I had sneakers. I thought we had it all. If I look back, I'm like, no, we didn't at all. So, but as, as you grow up, you, you, you only grow up once. You only have one set of environmental factors. And most of us are pretty okay with it. Um, or vice versa. Somebody could grow up and have lots of money and not know the value of money. So we have these, but when it comes to leadership, we start to get imprinted by people around us, by managers that we've had. You know, I look at the, I look at a lot of my habits that I have just as a leader, I can trace a lot of my habits to the first five, six, seven, eight years of my career. Um, oh, for sure. I think all of us can, right? Yeah. Um, and, so, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, and, and, and by the way, one thing I just want to say to people is you're, you're not always going to have good leaders, but I can tell you, I, I have probably taken some of my best leadership lessons from some less than stellar managers I had in my career. Because, you know, while I was working for him, I said, hey, it's a point in time. I'm going to work for him for a year. I'm going to work for him for two years, but they'll, I'll have another manager. But boy, when I'm a leader, here's something I don't not appreciate. Gonna here's something do I'm that. not going to do, but also just say, hey, I'm going to take what I can from them because they're, they're, they're one I'm thinking of in particular was a savant at sales, just wasn't a good leader. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to absorb all the sales strategy and sales techniques I can from this person. And I'm going to write lots of notes on all the things I don't want to do as a leader because they make me feel like horrible at least once a week. Right, right. Yeah, we can learn from every leader we've ever observed, uh, things we want to repeat and things we never want to subject our folks to, right? So uh, we've talked, been talking about imprinting and you, you said we're born, we had no fear. And then stuff happens and then we have fear. And so one of the big ideas of the book is to become a fearless leader. So why do you say that? And then secondly, what does it mean? Yeah, so I, I think over the last, I'm going to say three years in particular, and it, it kind of prompted me to write the book during this time, we've had an unprecedented opportunity to, to be a fearless leader. So, you know, COVID breaks out. I mean, a global pandemic, something that's never been seen by anybody living and hopefully never seen again. Um, we had supply chain constraints that we just haven't seen. I happen to be in the auto industry. We've never seen these type of constraints ever. Um, now, uh, look, let's look at interest rates. Over the last 22 months, we've had 11 interest rate hikes, unprecedented. So if you're in a leadership role, you're like, hold on here. I just got hit with COVID. I'm trying to figure out my workforce. Some of my clients aren't, aren't spending any money. My business is shut down. My business is changing. Um, I'm starting to get better. Now I can't even get my goods. My, the labor market's tight. Inflation's at 8%. All my employees are asking for a raise. And my interest rate on, on my debt on the company just, just went up. So you, you can take all that and you can just want to 
curl up into the fetal position. And by the way, you'd be warranted. You'd be warranted, right? It's not going to be very helpful, but it might be warranted. Or you can say, hey, I'm going to lean in to COVID and say, what opportunities are out there? So I'll give an example. We have a, we have an auto dealership, but we're we're a commercial fleet company. Our auto dealership shut down. So all of a sudden, we had twenty salespeople that had no role in the company. No one could come into the showroom. We also had a last mile business, which is home delivery. Think of um, all the Amazon's, UPS's, FedEx's, everyone delivered. All of a sudden, we said we're going to go take those twenty salespeople that know how to sell a used car, and we're going to ask them to help us rent cargo vans and pickup trucks to last mile company. So we retrained them and pivoted them. But that I had people saying, well, they've never, they've never leased a car before. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's an uncertainty you're bringing to the table. I'm trying to take 20 people that I'm pretty sure want to still be employed. And I think they're willing to get retrained in the matter of a couple of days. And some are going to succeed. Some are going to fail, but we're going to try. And I look at, uh, you know, I got, I got lots of friends in different businesses I look at the businesses that accelerated during COVID in general, you can point to some leaders in the company that really like stared down COVID and came up with new ways. And one of, one of them, I'm thinking of a restaurant door who just said, we're going to figure the model out. And, and I would have thought, wow, that's an industry that's just going to get wiped out. And their takeout business took off. Uh, they started dining in parking lot. I mean, just lots of things that you never would have thought about three months earlier. So I, I think that uh, what made me the timing of this book, I had been thinking about it for years. And then when COVID hit, we as a company really leaned into it and said, let's help our clients that are challenged and let's figure out new solutions and create new products for them. And our company reacted really well. And, and I think it was just a time that I, I started really putting pen to paper during that and saying, you know, what's the difference? And it's accepting, accepting we're going to try this and we might fail. You know, first of all, just stand as a leader, standing in front of your team, whether it's two people or 200 people or 20,000 people and saying, hey, we're going to try something and it's okay if it fails. I mean, that just sends the right message. On the back end, what I'll tell you is when you do fail, talk about it. So if you fail, don't like bury it. And, you know, we, we started a franchise business. We thought, hey, isn't this going to be great? A year later, we killed it. And we talked about it with the company. We said, hey, we tried this. It didn't work. That's okay. We'll keep bringing the ideas. But to somebody lower down in the organization, maybe at an entry level position, they're like, well, you failed and nobody got in trouble. You failed and nobody got fired. And, and who knows? I'll never know. How did that unlock some people from that might not normally raise their hand to now raise their hand because they saw, huh, it's okay to not always have the right answer. So it's easy for us to have this conversation and uh, and say, hey, don't be, don't have fear. Uh, failure is just a chance to learn. We can. It's easy to say all that, and most of us would even agree with it. But if let's say we're a leader in the middle of the organization and we've got some uh, other leaders around us, maybe that work for us that haven't quite gotten there yet, right? Like they're not quite there. Like how do we coach or uh, help some of our other leaders? Like it, it's it's fine if if you're saying, uh, hey, failure is not, is not final. It's a mistake. We'll learn from it. All of those things that you've just said, which I agree with. But what if the leaders between you and the front line aren't in that same place and 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 they're not able, willing, to, to, to treat failure uh, or mistakes in that same way, what do we do to help them uh, change their approach? Yeah, so so this is an interesting one. And I think uh, in general, general statement, the bigger the company you go, the harder some, some of these concepts are. Because, you know, you start to have businesses that have mature and have been around. And sometimes the fear of um, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And it's not a matter of if it's broken. It's a matter of if it's not maximized, improve it. And I think that's that's where, you know, as a, let's say you're, you know, a middle manager, as you said, and, and you're younger and you're like, but if I bring this and it doesn't work, it is going to cost me my job. If that's your fear or maybe not your job. And I think what, what I would challenge you to do is if you're doing the right thing, lean into it. 
it may it may turn out negative. I think you'd be surprised how often people are forgiving. And I think I think there's a little bit of the I'm not going to try it because of my fear. I'm not going to try because the company doesn't want me. I'm not gonna, like we we push innovation in trying things here. And I walk around the building every day and I hear people say that. And I'm like, is that the is that your thought of the company or is that your fear yeah. turning into I'm not doing it, not because of me, because I do it. I'm not doing it because the company. So keep in mind, a lot of times we project our fears as other people's uh, issues, not our own. I mean, I do that, right? You know, as a, as a dad, as a spouse, every once in a while, I'm like, hey, you know, hey, this is on you. When it's like, no, it's really on me and I'm putting it on them and vice versa, by the way. So, but what I would say is if you're, if you're, if you're really trying to overcome your fears, if you're really trying to overcome your uncertainty and you've had multiple instances at your company where uh, it's just been completely shut down. I do think there's a point in time, if that's who you are, that you do have to say, am I in the right division? Am I in the right segment of the company? Am I in the right leader? You might just pivot two leaders over to a different division. And you might be like, this, this other division is taking all sorts of opportunities and chances but the division I'm in, I'm in the, uh, let's pick an old, I'm in the commercial insurance division, which is probably risk averse. Mm-hmm. I'm going to join the emerging technologies division, which is looking at AI. And I'd say, boy, those two businesses, even if they're for the same company, probably have different risk tolerances, vif- different tolerances for accepting innovation and uncertainty and doubt. So sometimes you got you to gotta say, I'm not exactly in the right spot to leverage my skill set and my innovativeness. You said something a little bit ago that I think is really interesting, very helpful. And I think for any leader who wants to cultivate um, within their team the the willingness to try, the willingness to fail, the willingness to share their mistakes, you said, if you're making the decision with good intention, if you're trying something with, you know, for the right reasons. And I think so often for us as leaders, one of the things that we can coach people on is, you know, there's such a thing as a bad mistake. Yeah. And there's such a thing as a good mistake. A good mistake is one I made it. I had, I, I, based on the data I had, based on our goals, based on our strategy, based on, you know, a bunch of, bunch of valuable options. We're going to try this. It may not work. Okay. Good mistake. Right. As opposed to bad mistake. Well, I've tried this before. I'm going to try it again. Cause I really like it. Right. Bad mistake perhaps. <laughs> so it's just a matter of how we help. We, we need to think about it differently so we can help. Our, our teams. And I love where we started, which was that could be pretty deeply implanted. It may take us a while to get people past that. Right. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I, I just, just two days ago had my, my 54th birthday. I was uh first time CEO at 29. So I've, I've had a chance to do this for 25 years. And, and I look at the 29 year old CEO when people made mistakes, I was too, I, I, I'll, my EQ was not where it is today. Um, my IQ, I don't think I've gotten any smarter. I think incrementally smarter, but exponentially smarter on EQ. Because when somebody made a mistake, you know, we missed a number, we didn't do something right. It was, why'd you do that? Why didn't you do that? And what I realize now, when when that same instance comes across my desk or I see it in the hallway, the first thing I ask is, what was their intent? And, and I can tell you 70, 80, 90% of the time, it was just wasn't paying close enough attention um, missed it, truly tried something and it failed. And you sit there and say, no bad intention. Now, 10 or 20% of the time, somebody did ha- not hide something. They just thought they could fix it themselves and so on and so on and so on. Um, and as I say, we all know bad news doesn't age well. But like a- as I've improved my EQ over the years and really worked on it, because I think I had below average EQ um, in my late 20s and early 30s, I thought, you know, I thought the car only had, you know, gas pedal, not a gas and brake. And I kind of ran companies really hard. And and I, I look at, boy, how much fear did I unintentionally seed into the company? How many innovations did I potentially stop? Because somebody said, hey, I don't want to be wrong. And and I think as I've matured, and, and that's a message I, I relay to my team is, you know, hey, w- let us look at intent. By the way, if it's bad intent, you got to call bad intent out. You know, if someone just said, 
screw it. I heard what the company said. I'm not going to follow it. And you, you know, Hey, 10% of the people, life's a bell curve, right? 10% of the people, that's how they are. You, so you have to confront that. But you, if you just say, Hey, we, we went into that business. We didn't do enough research. We went really fast. Things were changing during COVID. Shouldn't have done it. Let's shut it down. I actually think that can help your company grow tremendously because then people are going to say, well, we can try things. We can learn. We can fail. And uh, what I try to do on my team is very openly talk about those because I think in, in, per, in my personal life, as well as my professional life, I think I've actually grown more in my failures than I have in my successes because I think we get more introspective when we're not successful. Like, why did that not work? I tried so hard. I did this. I did this. Sometimes when we win, you know, we have the champagne and we move well, on to the next won. win. Like, we're smart. Yeah. Right? Why wouldn't we have won? <laughs> uh, no, I think that's exactly right. And so having that moment of introspection for ourselves, having that, having that debrief, uh, uh, you know, learning lessons, whatever you want to call it from, from a project or from a team or from, a, 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 you know, any sort of activity is worth us doing. And I think you're, you're highlighting some really important stuff here. So I know that your organization has a theme every year. And I know that this year's theme is endurance. And I thought uh, we, before we start to move toward the, the end of our time together, I'd like to have you talk about that because anyone who's been listening uh, for the last 25 minutes, you know, can sense your energy. And so uh, they might be thinking, well, how do I keep up with this dude? Uh, my question is, why did you pick endurance and how is it impacting your organization this year? Yeah. So uh, this is my sixth year with the company. Interesting. I used to be this company's biggest client. That's how I got to know them. And then I was on the board and in my first year I came in, our theme was elevate. Let's elevate ourselves professionally and personally. Everyone just get better. The second year it was innovate. Let's not just get better, but let's do things differently. The third and fourth years were let's accelerate. So let's elevate ourselves. Let's do things differently and let's do it faster. And then, you know, as I was thinking about this year's theme and last year, the company went through a sale. We went from being a family owned business and, and we sold, we grew from 500 million to two and a half billion over the last uh, five years. And I said, boy, we've been on a great ride the last five years, but there's no guarantee that that ride's going to continue. There's lots of companies that had great years. There's lots of companies that had even great decades. And I remember at one, one point in time reading Jim Collins book, good to great. And it is good to great. He talks about great companies, Endure. Great companies are, aren't good for a decade. They're, they're, they're good for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So in this year, I kind of came to the company with endurance. And I said, we've been great the last five years. We've led our industry. We've gone from eighth in North America to fourth. Lots of champagne and things to celebrate. But can we keep our energy up? Can we continue to elevate? Can we continue to be innovative? Can we continue to pick up the pace? And can we have that endurance for an extended period of time for another five years? And I think it's an honest, open, transparent conversation with the, the company saying it's tough running hard every year. It's tough elevating every year. It's tough um, being more innovative in 23 than it was in 22. And by the way, being more innovative in 24 than in 23. And, and the world's, we could, we could name 30 companies, 10 companies, 100 companies that had their run and then petered out because they weren't able to keep that endurance up. They had an innovation, innovative product, maybe one, two, three evolutions and then didn't keep it up. So our theme for the year is endurance. And I think the cognitively recognizing doing it for an extended period of time is really, really hard. Yeah, we can sprint for a while, right? But endurance yeah. is a different is a different thing, right? So, um, I mentioned at the top that you you know you are both a leadership expert and expert leader, and so uh, I wanted to ask a question that I like to ask folks who have been leading teams and leading organizations for a long time, like what's the biggest? If you had to pick one, uh, what's the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned, Brendan? Uh, it, it's how important EQ is. Um, you know, I thought at a younger age, I thought it was, you know, how smart you were and how wor hard you worked. And I was the guy that was like, I'm not necessarily, uh, SAT smart, but I'm street smart and you can't, can't outwork me. What, as I developed through my career, I realized, you know, 
people work for people they want to work for and people do business with who they want to do, who they will. And people want to feel good about that. And I think that comes to being more self-aware of yourself and how you make others feel, but also being aware of other people and how they like to be led, how they like to do business, um, how, uh, you know, is, is public recognition important to them? Is, is private recognition important to them? You know, what do they like? And I think that, you know, I would say almost everybody, I don't know everybody listening to this podcast, but I would be willing to bet almost everybody listening to this podcast has all the IQ they need to get wherever they want to go. Generally speaking, we've got the IQ. It's, are they able to muster the EQ that's going to put them in a position surrounded by great people that want to run through that brick wall for them? And, and I think that's something that, you know, at uh, 28, 29, 30, I didn't have. And I'd say 35, 40, I, I was getting it. And if something from then on, I've, I've, I've channeled a, a lot of my um, moments and meetings of, hey, you know, your heartbeat's going faster. Just slow it down. And, and just being able to do that allows other people uh, the opportunity to succeed, the opportunity to fail. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions that I ask every guest, Brendan, and here they come. And yep. so we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, <laughs> one of them you know, and one of them you don't. So the first, the first one, like, what do you do for fun? Besides buy uh, headgear for your daughter, which she's going to go uh, on her skateboard. Like, yeah. what, do you do, what do you do for fun? Uh, so what I do for fun, I, I, I still love sports and I love, uh, I love racing, car racing. So I'm a big Formula One fan, um, big uh, endurance racing fan. So Right now, I'm on the Team McLaren bandwagon and United Auto Sports, so I enjoy that. Uh, both of my kids uh, still, they're one's a rising senior in high school and a junior in college, and they both play sports, so I enjoy doing that. Um, and I can tell you, the other day, uh, with 40 of our people in our company, I played my first pickleball game. So that might become a future endeavor of fun. That was a lot of fun. On Two Friday. guests in a row, everybody have mentioned pickleball yeah, uh, yesterday he, and today both. I, I don't know what that I guess, means. If, if we were I doing do this know. last Thursday, I wouldn't have mentioned it on Friday. And, and it, it, you know what? It was, I had one person on the team who's not athletic say that was the great equalizer. I was as good as anybody out there, but if we had played golf or we had played tennis, they might not have. So, uh, so, so, uh, so I, I don't know if I'm going to take it up, but I, I kind of like the, the fun of it, but you know, being with family, traveling, uh, sports, and uh, car racing. Perfect. So um, when you're not doing those things and leading your team uh, and not writing books, the question is, what are you reading? What's something you've read recently, Brendan, that maybe you'd share with us all? So I've got, I've got two books that I'm just about done. Um, one is my favorite book of all time that I'm rereading. And because I've, I've given it to so many people and I'm like, you know, I need to reread it. And that's The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. It's, it's probably my all time favorite business book. Cause for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years since I've read it the first time, I try to find tipping points in the businesses that I'm a part of. And the second one, and I don't know why I didn't read this when it came out. Cause it's such a good book is atomic habits. Um, and by the way, it's just so well-written. It's so basic. You read a chapter and you go, yeah, yeah, I'm doing most of it, but not all of it. And, you know, I look at a book and say, you know, you don't have to read a book and sit there and say, I'm going to go bring it to the company and go change how we do anything. I, th I think that can be dangerous, quite frankly. But do you take one or two things away from the book that are going to make you better tomorrow? Uh, and the tipping point is just kind of re-energizing me for finding that next tipping point in merchants. And Atomic Habits is more about, hey, I want to improve my game. You know, I still have to elevate this year. I've got some pretty good habits, but how do how do I get better? How do I improve some things? And, and I'm only halfway through that one. I just finished tipping point on Sunday. Um, but uh, I, I, I like the simplicity of atomic habits quite a bit. All right. So now the question is, uh, what uh, do you, where do you want to point us? How do we learn more about what you're up to? How do we get a copy of the book, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I'll hold it up again. The book again is called the FUD factor, overcoming fear, uncertainty, and doubt achieve the impossible. Where do you want to point us to get the book or anything else you want to tell us about? Yeah, what, what I'd say is it's on Amazon, which is great because you can get the book on Amazon and then hopefully one of our trucks can deliver it to you. So it's, <laughs> it's a double hit. Um, you know, Barnes & Noble, some of the stores have it instead of a lot of the airports, but I think Amazon's probably the, the best way, uh, barnesandnoble.com. Um, 
you know, I, I do try to put uh, a lot of my content on my site, brendanpkeegan.com. Um, also, you know, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I've got a newsletter every month that goes out. You can subscribe to that. It's Fearless Leadership. Uh, you can look me up, Brent, Brendan P. I, I use my middle initials so you don't get confused on the different Brendan Keegans out there. Uh, and then on Instagram, I actually find a lot of people on Instagram, Paul, because they're just little sound bites. They're just little pieces. Like every Friday, I put a Fearless Friday leader out, somebody that I've met somewhere in the world and tell their story. Uh, and I'm BPK, Brendan P. Keegan, BPK Fearless on on um, on Instagram. So you can get it on um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, my, my website has a lot of my content. If somebody wants to reach out to me, brendanpkeegan.com, and then LinkedIn and Instagram. Perfect. So before we go and before we say goodbye, I'm going to ask all of you, I'm done asking questions of Brendan, but all the, qu the question I ask you every single week is now what? What idea are you going to take from this, as Brendan just said, and apply something? If you don't apply something from this, pleasant perhaps, entertaining perhaps, but useful Maybe not unless you take action. So what action will you take? What idea will you take from this? Maybe it's picking up a copy of the FUD Factor. Maybe it's thinking about how the things you're saying are imprinting uh, fears, uncertainties, or doubts on your team. Maybe it's some of the ideas that we talked about, how you could create greater amounts of collaboration with your team, how you could create greater endurance with your team, even the idea of having a theme for your organization, whatever it might be. Those are just a few of the things we talked about. The most important thing is the one that you found that resonated with you, that you go act on now as a result of being here. I hope you'll do that. Uh, Brendan, thank you again so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. All right. Thank you, Kevin. It's been great and a fan of your work and we'll continue to follow you and, and listen to your, broad, your podcasts. And everybody, we'll be back again next week. So come on back for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Make sure you like and subscribe and you know what to do and tell, an, tell a friend to come as well next week. Another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We'll see you all then.